Okay, uh, this is an interview with Anthony D'Angelo, Tuesday, September 17th, 2002, uh, approximately 10, 15 a.m. at the Holiday Inn, Westbury, Long Island, New York. Interviewer is Michael Russert. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Mm -hmm. Well, my full name is um, Anthony D'Angelo. I um, was born in October 19, 1919, and the place of birth was uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, what was your education prior to entering military service? Well, I uh, attended elementary, junior high, and high school. Uh, textile high school is in uh, Manhattan, mm -hmm. 16th Street, New York. And uh, I went to, uh, I took courses in the service as uh, uh, radio mechanics. And uh, when I was um, discharged from the service, I went to school under the GI Bill of Rights and went to Manhattan Technical Institute. And I took up uh, radio electronics. Mm -hmm. And I became um, a radio and television repairman. I worked at that for a number of years, and then I went to work for um, American Machine and Foundry. And at that time, they were in the process of developing uh, the uh, hydrogen bomb. Of course, this was all secret at that mm -hmm. time. I'm telling you this because you know so so many years have passed, and it's not a secret anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was involved in uh, testing the um, uh, 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 reactor, the, uh, the rod mechanism to controlling the, the temperature in the reactor. And my job was the testing of the uh, clutches so that in an emergency these rods would, be, would come down and try to neutralize mm -hmm. the reactor. From there, I went to work with uh, Fairchild's Space and Defense Systems, mm -hmm. and they were involved in a number of uh, things. Uh, they made uh, uh, cameras for, for uh, uh, rockets that uh, flew over, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, a spy, spy rocket that, uh, that flew over Russia and places like that, and they would take photographs. Uh, of the different locations where, where the Russians were building uh, a, 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 a space uh, vehicles, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back uh, to um, when did you hear about, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor and what was your reaction to that? <laughs> well, at that time I was um, going to a theater in New York. I was with uh, my girlfriend, which is my wife now, and we were going to the Paramount Theater. And I had a car at that time, and we're driving, and uh, the radio, uh, come on, and uh, Pearl Harbor, you know, nobody knew exactly where what Pearl Harbor was, you know, Pearl Harbor, we never heard of Pearl Harbor, but then we knew what the uh, Japanese have done, and uh, that's how I heard of it. And it was in the afternoon sometime on a Sunday, and uh, I was driving in Manhattan. What was your reaction? How what were your feelings? Well, I felt very bad, of course. You know, everyone uh, was uh, surprised and amazed that the Japs would do such a thing. But I used to read a lot, you know, and I used to read about the um, newspaper about two ships for one. They, they always wrote about it. Japan builds one ship, America should build two ships. But we never did anything about it. And that's the trouble with this country. We wait until somebody does something and then we react. And now the same thing with, uh, with uh, the, the, this uh, Twin Towers or, or other. You know, we were really disarmed. We had no soldiers. The American soldiers were considered uh, 
uh, outcast, you know, uh, that no one, uh, of course there was a depression going on at that time, and people that didn't have a job uh, figured we'll go in the army and we'll get three meals a day and they'll get a place to sleep, and that's what it was. So people didn't think much of uh, uh, an American soldier at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, after Pearl Harbor, a lot of uh, the young boys like myself, of course I didn't volunteer, went down to volunteer. To, to, to serve in the in the service, you know, mm -hmm. because this was a bad thing that the Japanese had done. Mm -hmm. So you were drafted? I, I was drafted after, uh, because I just became 21, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I was drafted. Uh, in fact, I went into the service, it was March 3rd, uh, 1942. I was uh, inducted into the service, and I went in, uh, to uh, to Camp Upton, Long Island. There was a, a, an inducting uh, station, and uh, that's where I got inducted. From there, they uh, shipped me down to, uh, at that time it was called Camp Lee, now it's called Fort Lee, Fort Lee, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And while there, I had um, uh, training, and I was entered into the medical service, and I had medical training. I was trained as a, a medical technician, and uh, after that, I was shipped to. Uh, in fact, I was shipped to. Uh, uh, I forget. The, well, anyway, Langley Field, Virginia. After the medical training, you know, they had uh, 13 weeks of training, and uh, from Langley Field, Virginia. Uh, one morning they told a number of us, uh, I guess they went down the list, A, B, C, D, to pack your <laughs> equipment, uh, you're being moved. Uh, from there I was moved to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Now I only had like uh, 13 weeks of training and, and here I find myself in Fort Dix and what did I find there? I find that the, 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 the the place I was sent to was with the 1st Armored Division. And they just came up from uh, New Orleans, they were training in the desert and they were getting ready to ship overseas. And I, I went into the uh, 47th Medical Battalion, which was part of the 1st Armored Division. And. Uh, we stayed in Fort Dix, but while we were in Fort Dix, we were um, loading vehicles, we were vehicles on, uh, on um, uh, 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 trains, uh, flat cars, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't know where they were going, but anyway, we had an idea that <laughs> we were going to go overseas. So uh, that's what we did. I did that for about a month. I stayed in uh, Fort Dix, uh, beside the other duties. Uh, we would load these vehicles, uh, put them on flat cars and stuff like that, and they would ship them out. And uh, m most of the division went overseas on the Queen Mary. But I was left behind, a number of us, we were called the rear echelon. In other words, we were left there to clean up the, the rest of the stuff. So when we did all that, they uh, load us on a train, and the train went to uh, Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> and the Boston, Massachusetts put us on a, on a ship. It was a small ship. And this ship, we, we, we looked down, it was a real small ship. And, and we looked down the hatch, it was loaded with ammunition. And I says to one of the sailors, I says, where, where do you fellas come from? You know, she says, oh, we come from Brooklyn. The Erie Basin, I said, wow, the Erie Basin, uh, 50, I knew that was an ammunition place. Because <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn, you know, and I uh, did all of my, my time, young life, you know, were running around and stuff. So I was very familiar with that area. It was a real army base. And, and, and well, anyway, and that's what loaded on that ship. And that ship uh, took us 16 days. We were in a convoy. From, uh, we left from Boston, we went to Halifax, uh, Canada. We, when we were in Halifax, Canada, 
We met a convoy next morning. There was like a thousand ships. And we start to sail across the ocean. So I guess we were a small, a slow ship because it was an old, it was called the SS North King. And uh, it took us 16 days to go across. Of course, they were zigzagging. And in the meantime, we, uh, we, we see them the dropping uh, depth charges, you know, and we see the water going up, you know, and that come cruisers and uh, destroyers uh, cycling the convoy, you know, trying to keep the submarines. But we were lucky. Well, we still, you know, see something, but we didn't know what it was, you know, distances. Who knows if ships were being uh, torpedoed or not. So, well, anyway, and we made our way to, uh, to uh, 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 Belfast Island. We landed in Belfast Island. And from Belfast Island, they took us to uh, an area called uh, uh, a town uh, right near the city. It was called Newcastle. It was about 30, 30 miles uh, south of, uh, of Belfast. It was an area. I forget the name of the area. It was a nice place. There was a castle there. And um, what we did there was we, we uh, had a, 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 a building there and we uh, put our equipment and we established a, a small uh, aid station, battalion aid stations, which we took care of the troops. A lot of soldiers didn't all had their shots re already, you know, so we were giving them the shots and stuff like that. And uh, we stayed and, uh, of course, they warned us about German paratroopers, you know, and we were always on guard at night, you know. Uh, a lot of soldiers were, you know, from different outfits. Of course, we were the medics. But they also gave us guns. <laughs> you know, of course, they, they had trained us to, to, to fire the guns and stuff like that. But uh, so at night, you know, we would patrol, you know, look up. But the Germans never came. And from there, they shipped us uh, across to, uh, to England. And we landed in, um, in Scotland. It was called Stranard, Scotland. And from there, we took a train and we went down to... Um, a town called Wimslow. So I remember all these things. And uh, from there, you know, uh, we start uh, get all our equipment back from uh, uh, from uh, Ireland into England. And from England, uh, they were getting ready. Of course, we didn't know at that time. They were getting ready for the invasion of North Africa. So we in England, then we went down to... Um, to Liverpool, and there were big ships there, and so we started loading all the equipment on the ships, of course. We loaded our ambulances, we loaded our uh, uh, supply trucks, and uh, t we had big uh, tents, you know, for hospital tents, so we had that all taken care of. But before that, they loaded all the infantrymen, the tanks, and all that stuff, so we were the last, you know, on the line. <laughs> Well, those ships were leaving already, you know, uh, that we loaded up anyway. So, then we found out that while we were on the water, they come over the speakers that uh, the troops uh, had landed uh, in, uh, in Oran, <clears throat> North Africa. American troops landed in Oran, Casablanca and all that area. There was the invasion of North Africa. And we were heading that way, so when we got there already, the, the beaches were established, so we had no problem, you know, unloading all our equipment and stuff like that. So we remained there for a while, maybe a, a couple of a weeks or two, until all our equipment, because when we landed, we had no equipment, we had nothing, you know, and uh, so when all our equipment got together, you know, we got all our ambulances back, we got, of course, at that time, I was an ambulance driver. I became an ambulance driver. So, and uh, so when we the ambulance just come back and all that, we got all our equipment together. We started headed for towards uh, <clears throat> what was the name of that the town anyway? Yeah. Well, anyway, we 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 started headed for where do we? Uh, the 8th Army was battling uh, 
Rommel, the German uh, panzers in the, in the desert there. And uh, when we got there, you know, we were all gun ho you know, Americans, well, you know, we, we figured we were strong, we we're going to beat everyone, you know. So the tanks, you know, these Germans, they, 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 <laughs> they sucked us in, you know, they, they had a few tanks there, you know, and, and the Americans, you know, they, uh, they start to go, you know, they're going to knock these German tanks out, but all of a sudden the Germans turned their guns around. They had 88 millimeter guns on their cannons. We had terrible guns. Our, our guns was a 75, or World War I gun, terrible, terrible gun. And they knocked all our tanks out. Before you know, the guys start to run back. They left the tanks, they, and, and this place was called Kasserine Pass. So we start to retreat. And the Germans were, there was a place there where we had all our supplies, and he was heading for the supplies. But up north, there was a British, um, <clears throat> a British uh, armored division, was also called the First, Arm, First British Armored Division. And they came down. So they came down, and the Eighth Army started to attack from the other side, so they were closing in. So now Rommel felt that if he kept coming after us, they were going to close him in. So he moved back again to push them away, and that saved us, you know. Then we started to get new equipment, better, better equipment, you know. And then, but we never, we never went in to really battle them. We were there to hold the line. But meantime, my job was we were treating all the wounded that were coming in, you know. Of course. <laughs> I never saw any wounded before, you know, of course, we, 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 they taught us about it, they showed us movies, they told us how to uh, treat different uh, 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 wounds and how to stop the blood and all that stuff, how to put the tunicates, but we knew all that kind of stuff. So, well, that was a good experience. So we learned, you know, and we started to treat all these wounded that were coming in and uh, that was in... Uh, in um, uh, North Africa, of course, then we went like up into Crazy Tunisia. Crazy question. So, your first experiences treating wounded was after Kazarine Pass? Yes, and, in that area there, uh -huh. you know, in Tunisia and Basurda and places like that, you know. And uh, of course, then, you know, we became hardened to that stuff, you know. Continue with your story, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Continue with your story, oh, I'm, I'm well, sorry. Well, uh, then we, um, after the Germans surrendered in North Africa, uh, we rode back. We rode back to um, an area called, well, it was called Rabat, uh, Casablanca, uh, Fiez. Uh, we went back almost uh, to where we first had landed uh, when we land entered uh, North Africa. And there we start to receive new equipment. Of course, we thought we were going to go home, you know. <laughs> so I said, oh, we're going home, you know, we're going back, you know. But that wasn't the case. So we start to receive all new equipment. Of course, when I say we receive, I mean the first armored division. Mm -hmm. You know, they were getting better tanks, a better gun. Now they had a 90 millimeter, 90 millimeter gun, and it was called a Sherman tank. It was a better built tank. It, it had uh, a better turret, of course. What they did is they captured a lot of German equipment. They brought it back to the United States. And they copied a lot of stuff they copied because our technology at that time wasn't that great. You know, we, we, we were more or less uh, industrial. Uh, we didn't build any uh, war equipment and stuff like that. As that's, that's as far as I know because I used to read a lot, you know. I was kind of interested in, in uh, history and... Uh, well, anyway, so then we um, we got a, a new equipment and uh, we went back and we went back to, um, oh, I forgot the town. Well, anyway, it was a seaport. And, uh, of course, then we found out that they had invaded Sicily. And in Sicily, they, they, they didn't last long because we were ready. We were... We were the next to go over, but by the time we, we were ready to go over, the war in Sicily had ended. So we didn't go over, we stayed in North Africa. And from there, we 
found out that uh, they had a, the next invasion was in um, in uh, Salerno, Salerno, Italy. I think that was in um, in September, sometime in September, uh, nineteen forty-two. No, September. Well, maybe forty-three. Anyway, so after Salerno was secured, we 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 landed uh, someplace above Salerno. It was uh, we couldn't land in Naples because, uh, of course, they didn't have captured Naples yet, and all the ships were sunk. The Germans had sunk a lot of ships in the in the ports, so we wouldn't be able to get into uh, to uh, uh, Naples. But it was just below Naples we landed, some place near Pompeii, because I remember Mount Silvio. You know, we could see it. You know, and uh, we came in at night. Of course, we we you know we came in on the. Uh, uh, small barges, LSTs, you know, like, uh, we had no equipment. They put us in a field there. Trucks came, picked us up, brought us someplace, and uh, then we had to wait for all our equipment to come. But meantime, they were battling there, and then we found out it was um, Volturno River and all that area there, and Mark Clark, you know. And when we finally got our equipment, when we really got our equipment, we, we uh, we, I remember, we start to move through. We went through the river there. We had, we had a, there was pontoon bridges, you know, they had built, and the water was, uh, you know, the, the the river, you know, was uh, it was uh, rain, a lot of rain, oh, rain, and uh, uh, well, anyway, we went across, and we went into a field, and we set up all our equipment, you know, and then Can we you explain how your medical facility looked when you set it up? How many tents were there? How many men? Could you tell us Well, about we had uh, the, the 47th Battalion consisted of, uh, uh, of uh, three companies, uh, A, B, and C, three medical companies, and headquarters. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, what our um, unit, I was in Company C. We had two uh, what they call surgical trucks it was a big truck. It was all enclosed. It was like a van, and in the truck was an operating table, and we had a uh, sterilizing equipment, autoclaves, stuff like that, and we had a, a, a water tank. Now. We had a, a tent that went over this truck. It covered the truck and also all over the truck and on the sides. And there we would set up operating tables. And uh, we had lights on the side that would extend over these tables. And uh, when you went into the tent, you had sort of camouflaged. It was like a long tent, so that when you carried a person on the litter, you know, you went into there, mm -hmm. and then you went into the tent. So there were three operating places that you could use. There was one in the truck, um, one on each side of the truck. And uh, there were swads, each swad. There was one swad, you know, for in the truck, and uh, you had a sergeant, uh, uh, doctors, do of course, all our officers were doctors. Mm -hmm. so, so you had a squad, you know, you had uh, your doctor and you had your, your sergeant, and, and, uh, and then the men were in that group. So each group, so, you know, you took turns. But when you were in the battle and uh, you're getting a lot, everybody was, so we had two trucks like this that consisted, and they were placed at different positions. That was Company C. Company A or B had the same thing, but we all weren't in combat at the same time. Some were in reserves. So if we were up in the front, maybe Company A would be back re in a reserve, or Company C would be in another, uh, Company B would be in another area doing the same thing that we were doing. And uh, of course, I, I, as an ambulance driver, would go up to uh, 
where the battle was taking place, and that was called a battalion aid station. Now, that would be either maybe a small farmhouse or some place where they have a little secure, you know. And uh, the, 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 the combat medics were, were with, with the soldiers that were fighting. They would, either they or the soldiers themselves would bring the wounded down and it would bring them to, into, the, uh, into the aid station. When they get to the aid station, uh, the doctors and other technicians would give them a first aid. Uh, they, uh, there was a, a wound, they would try to stop the blood or give them a, um, uh, a, a shot of morphine, you know, and uh, write a tag what the, the, what the wound was, you know, and uh, put his name and all that on the tag. So then I would get this person and put him in my ambulance. There may be two or three. We were able to put... Um, three litters in the ambulance and you also had the two uh, two benches sitting that would fold up on the side uh, that would be put down there would be one man in the middle and two would be up on the top on the straps we had straps with hooks and uh, so I would drive them back you know sometimes it'd be five miles depending how close we'd be able to get but always we were on the artillery fire. See, it was that close that, you know, the artillery would fire right over us, especially when we were on the Anzio beachhead. See, now, we had no place to, 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 for any type of a cover because we were right, you know, in the middle of the battle going on. And mostly, the, I'm talking about Anzio Beach now. Of course, this is after Italy, you know, we went through, uh, we went through uh, the Otorno River, went through Mount Casino, and that's where we got stuck. We got stuck on Mount Casino. Of course, I know all this because, you know, and then I remember that uh, the bombers came one day, you know, about 500 of them, like 30, 36 planes at a time, you know, and they came over and they bombed at the Mount Casino because they felt that the Germans were using this as an observation point. But then we found out that they weren't used, and I, we, we don't know, you know, uh, it's a lot of different things, but in the war, you know, you, you, you just worry about your part there, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, they bombed that whole thing, and they still couldn't get through. So they pulled us back, when I say pulled us back, I mean the whole division because we were part of the first armored division. We went back to Naples. They waterproofed the vehicles. So I guess you know what when when I say waterproof, you know a lot of people know what I'm talking about. You know, like the mufflers and stuff like that. They put pipes they up so that the muffler wouldn't be in the water. That would stop the vehicle. And they tape all the um, all the places uh, where water would enter into the engine, you know, to block the Well, anyway, we did all that, and we were, um, we, they put us on uh, landing crafts, you know. Oh, that's another story there. Well, being I was an ambulance driver, they put us, they let us in first, so you're back in. And we backed in all the way back of the ship. It was a landing craft. Then all the other vehicles came in. Besides that, you know, and then they closed the doors. We left the vehicles down below. We went up on top. They had all um, in the aircraft guns. All they put them all on top of the top of the ship. This landing barge, so if planes would come, you know. Anyway, so it took us one night to to to, to travel to uh, Anzio, you know. But Anzio had already been secured. The, the day before, two days before, I don't know, something like that. Well, anyway, so now we're, we're on the ship, so they give us orders, man your vehicles. So now everybody ran down, and they got on into the vehicles down below in, in, in the ship. So and then, and then they said, start your engines. Everybody starts the engines. So now way in the back, you know, and everybody's starting the engines. So now all the fumes are starting to come in the ship. But the ship isn't landing. The doors are still closed. So all the fumes, you know, start coming into the ship. 
and everybody's coughing and sneezing and guys getting, we're going to do it, you know, the guys starting to go all excited, you know, and, and we didn't know what to do, you know. So all of a sudden we hear a ship hit, boom, and, and, and the chains come down, and the doors open up, you know, oh, and, and they tell, get out, get out, you know, and all the vehicles start driving out, you know, and they tell us, go, you know, where we would go, you know, you can't move. Well, anyway, I was way in the back, and I come out, I'm driving, no, I drive right off the beach, and then we find out we were, uh, and the, uh, the landing place was Netuno, Netuno Anzio. So we went all the way in, you know, and uh, the, then we got all our equipment, like I said, and we set up the the the, the uh, hospital tents and stuff like that, getting ready, you know, uh, to, to to take in the wounded, and uh, then uh, you know, of course, you know, Barenzio there, we uh, it was a big battle there. To, uh, was in, uh, we landed in January something, and then in February one time the uh, Germans put a big push on, you know, and tried to uh, drive us into the sea. But, you know, we, uh, we were in the middle of the air, we were getting wounded, we, we didn't know what's what, and they figured, well, uh, the science thought of uh, trying to evacuate, you know, the waters came back, but we couldn't evacuate. So the, we didn't pay any attention to that because we couldn't do anything. You know, we were in the middle. Of, well, we couldn't leave anybody, anybody there like that. I'm getting a little emotional. It's okay. But anyway, then we found out that uh, they held. You know. The Germans retreated because uh, they had uh, destroyers and cruisers firing from the water, you know, and plus all the guns that we had on the on the beach were all firing the tanks. Everything was opening up on them, so the Germans uh, they were losing too much, so they they retreated, and that what saved us. So this went on like. Uh, then they tried to pull another attack, and the same thing happened. And, uh, but my job, like I said, was I used to drive up and uh, pick up the wounded, uh, you know, up, uh, of course, the whole place was, uh, <laughs> was a battle zone, you know, there was, so well, anyway, I used to drive at night mostly because in the daytime, they observation and they see a little dust or anything like that. And the Germans had all the roads zeroed in. They, they were up on the hills, you know, and they had all these big guns and, and they would fire on them. You know. But they knew where we were. We had all big red crosses. So there was also an English hospital next to us. We were in a hospital, we were a battalion aid station, but there was a hospitals back on the side of some place where they had nurses, you know, we had no nurses, we never had nurses. But we, hear, we used to hear stories about, uh, you know, that uh, the German, you know, German planes used to come over at night to bomb because during the daytime we had cover. American planes would fly over, cover, and uh, they wouldn't come in the daytime. But as soon as, soon as it got dark, the American planes would leave, and we see them come. <laughs> they come. <laughs> they would come over, you know. But mostly they were about after the ships, because the ships weren't loading all the supplies and ammunition, you see. But a lot of times, uh, well, I don't know about the pilots, but they, they would get uh, scared or whatever, you know, too much firing going up, so they would drop their bombs any place and go. So one time we got hit with bombs, incendiary uh, bombs, but we were lucky. It didn't hit any of our tents all around us, all these incendiary bombs. So, we, we, you know, with our helmets, we, we took our helmets off and, and put all the sand and, and uh, put the things all out anyway. So we uh, remained on the Anzio beachhead about four months. But before that, every morning, of course, 
my job was going back and forth, you know, and I was pretty lucky. Thank God, I was lucky, you know. I, I used to drive at night, you know. I, well, one time I almost got killed because, uh, you know, it was dark, we are in the woods there, and uh, these tanks were coming down. See, at night the tanks used to go up, up to the front, and they would use the, the cannons uh, to fire, you know, because and then in, in the daytime they would pull back and they would hide under these these trees, they would camouflage them because everything was under observation on the Anzio Beach. There was no place you could go that uh, you were safe, so that's what it was. They, they knew exactly where, where you were. They knew where the ammunition dumps were and all, they would fire on the ammunition dumps until they would set them on fire and all the explosion, you know, at night, you know, it was like 4th of July. <laughs> You know, well anyway, so I was with my, uh, my partner, it used to be two, two, two men, sometimes I would be alone, but, but this time we were two of us uh, uh, driving the ambulance, you know, we had pick up some wounded, we had wounded in the ambulance and we were taking, trying to take them back, but these tanks were on the road and they were coming down and um, tanks have uh, but they used to call them cat's eyes, blue red lights on the tanks. All the vehicles had these little red dots that you could see the vehicle. So they were coming, you know. I says, wait a minute, let me go see, you know. I'll tell you, we had to cross this road. So I get out of the ambulance, of course he was driving then, and I'm looking, you know, I see these tanks come down. Then I didn't see any lights. I says, so I stepped out, I says, come on. So as I says to him to come on, this tank had no lights on. And this track went around my shirt, just like this. If I would have stepped another foot, I would have been under that tank. So he, I felt him on my shirt, you know, pulling like this, to the side of the tank, you know. And that scared me. <laughs> so I says, the hell would you? I'm not getting that. We'll wait until, you know, so finally we, we heard no more noise, you know, because the tanks should have made noise, all the traction, all, all that thing. So we finally went through and uh, we took the wounded back and stuff like that. And I remember one time my captain says to me, I don't want you to bring any more dead guys here. I don't want you to make that trip with all the dead. Lead them over there. Let the, the grave registration take them because they want to get rid of <laughs> Italian aid station. They want to get rid of the wounded or the dead. So, I, I so <laughs> it's funny, you know, uh, you know, uh, to talk about things like this. So I says, this guy alive, you know. I looked as <laughs> I don't want to take, you know, make the trip. Anyway, so finally, um, uh, there was like in May. May we start to get a lot more. Oh, and before that, every morning. Every morning, about seven o'clock in the morning, for about a week, everything used to open up. All the guns that they had on the beachhead, any gun, 75 millimeter and up, they would fire. The the the, the, the destroyers and the uh, cruisers would fire for about a half an hour every morning. Everything would go, oh, the noise, you know, wow. And uh, they did that for about a week. So one night, the orders came that we should pack up all our stuff. So we packed, you know, we broke down the tents and all that. We packed them up, you know, and we, you, we had a system, you know, we could put up a tent in 20 minutes. <laughs> so we, we broke everything down, you know. We loaded all the stuff onto the trucks and all that. We were raiding, you know. And that night, the, the Americans start to attack, you know. Of course, before that, they, every night they used to bring them guns up forward. They used to camouflage them all and lead them there and come back, come back in the morning so the Germans wouldn't know. But that night, all the men went up there. They mounted all these guns, you know, so that the ones from the back. Well, anyway, so they attacked. And they broke through. That was in um, uh, May 25th, I think. They broke through, and we start to move. Of course, 
the infantry and the tanks were moved, and uh, we stopped to go. But it took us like, it was only 20 miles, it took us 20 days to get into uh, Rome. That was the liberation of Rome at that time. I don't know if you want to hear any more. No. Yeah, but we'll stop right here. I have to change tapes. Oh. Okay. So now we're into Rome, <coughs> and it uh, was beautiful, you know, to see that all the people were so happy to see us, and, uh, you know, wow, we're in Rome, you know. Did you, did you speak Italian at all, or? Yes, uh -huh. yes, I, 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 uh, I spoke Italian, you know, but um, I learned from my, uh, my grandparents and my parents, so it was a great help to me. See, while well, I was in Italy, in fact, uh, I was a great help to the chaplain. We had a chaplain there with us, you know, of course, uh, whenever we, we needed him for the last rites, you know, we would call him, you know, and he would, we, we felt someone was uh, on way out, you know, a soldier, you know, and we would call him, but... Um, he used to call on me to, uh, 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 we were sometimes in a town where we were in the rest area. Of course, we never always were on, uh, on the front combating. Of course, sometimes they would pull us back to certain areas and maybe some other company would go up and take over. So we give us a chance that we would clean ourselves up, you know, take a shower and tell us where we could take a shower and, and they give us all clean clothes and stuff like that, you know and uh, you could ride home. So, well, the chaplain would uh, ask me if I would go with him uh, to, uh, maybe he could uh, borrow the church. Mm -hmm. I was Catholic, you know, and he was also a Catholic chaplain, so he, so he could say mass in the church, so I would go with him, you know, and we'd uh, get the pastor and on, and we'd mention to him, you know, with a, and if there would be a possible time for a, for the chaplain to be, and they, they would agree to that, or they were very happy to have him, uh, so we would pass the word around to the, to the division, uh, whoever was in that area, that there was going to be a mass in the church, and uh, we would hold a mass there, and I was nice that, that that was one way, and then a lot of officers <laughs> used to take me to, they want to go shopping, uh, buy something, you know, and they would call me, and I would take them with the ambulance, you know, into town or whatever, where, uh, if we were near a town, and uh, they would do a little shopping. But that helped me a lot, you know. So I, I, I learned a lot also, because I, I wasn't too uh, good at speaking, but when I was in Italy and I spoke to the different the civilians and stuff like that, I started to pick it up. So I, I became a <laughs> very good, you know, speaker, which I could speak today. In fact, um, I'm going to go to... Um, Italy uh, next month, October 4th, you know. Mm -hmm. We're going to visit my wife's relatives. They live in Sicily. That's getting off the s story here. But anyway, now we're, we're, oh, we're in Rome now. So, after Rome, we came off Anzio, after Rome, we started to mo move up, you know. It wasn't too bad then because uh, the Germans wouldn't fight on um, on level ground, you know, they always uh, went for high ground, and they would have uh, they would get civilians or people to to help build the fortifications up in the mountains, you know. And uh, I think the next place was like the Gustav Line. They had a line called the Gustav Line, and uh, it was like all tank traps and stuff like that, you know. And uh, we went through that, and then we went up into uh, went to uh, to um, next. We were in uh, Florence. We went through Florence, and uh, we went up through uh, up through that area there, Siena, and places like that. You know, it wasn't too bad for us at that time because now we could stay a little further back. See, so we were a little more safer than we were when we were on the Anzo Beachhead. But we still were under artillery fire, 
because we couldn't be too far away, you know. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't help them too much. That, so maybe we were maybe five miles or something like that from where the actual uh, fighting was taking place. But then I, uh, in fact, uh, we were going, I don't know, at night, we were moving up someplace and we had a couple of wounded in the ambulance there and uh, I wasn't driving then. My partner was driving because we were two. Sometimes he would drive, sometimes I would drive. Well, he felt he wanted to drive, you know, we were moving up. So they stopped the shelling the road, you know, you hear the shells coming down, but you never know where the hell they're hitting, you know, because you hear the sound, you know, and all that. So he must have got scared. And he, I see the road turning to the right, and I see him turning the wheel to the left, and I try to grab the wheel, you know. And before I know it, the ambulance went over. We went over the cliff. We tumbled down, and we got caught on a, a tree there someplace. Down there were some other vehicles behind us, and they came to help us. Now, a good thing I had put my helmet on, and my head was under the, the clutch, and <laughs> the brake, you know, and I couldn't figure out where I was, and I looked at the doors. Well, anyway, they came, they helped us, they took us out. We, we got a good thing these fellows were seriously wounded, you know, they were like walking wounded. And uh, they took them out, and another ambulance came, you know, and they put them in there, and they, they took us out anyway. And we, we went with the next day, I don't know, I never saw that ambulance again. So I, uh, I went to the captain, you know, and I told him, listen, I says, you know, I can't see anymore, I says, you know, at night I, I get illusions, I says, the lights, the, the, the I, I, I can't see the road, so he says, okay, okay, he says, he says, uh, what do you, well, he says, the only place I, you, you could put you in this is in the, uh, put you in the surgical team, man, I don't want to be in that there, but I says, okay, I'll, <laughs> so I became a, a surgical Technician, I didn't drive the. I got off the ambulance. I, I didn't drive anymore because the lights, you know, these little lights. Sometimes they look and close to you. And next time they're far away. You know, it's hard to judge. You know, after a while, you know. But anyway, so I, I, I was in the surgical team, and uh, I helped. You know, in surgery. I uh, I uh, also. Uh, being I was uh, more or less in my younger time interested in electronics and electricity, I took care of uh, the maintenance of the electrical systems. I would take care of the generator. We had a generator that made the power. I would set up all the lights in the operating room, you know, put up the lights because we had to have light. You couldn't wait, you know, it was all camouflaged, of course. The tents were all closed, camouflaged. I would have put, put the lights by, by the operating rooms and stuff like that. I took care of the generator, you know, gas it up and make sure that when we left, I would get it hooked up to one of the trucks and stuff like that and get the gasoline, stuff like that. I also um, uh, took care of, we get blood plasma, see, they didn't, well, they had whole blood, but it was difficult to give people whole blood. So they had what they call plasma. Plasma was a, a white corpuses of the blood, a white, and it was dried, dried blood. It was like a powder, and it came in a box. It was a very nice system we had. It came in a box, and you had a saline water, you know, sterile water, and the powder, and you had all the, uh, all the, uh, the, the, the little hoses and stuff like that, and the needles, everything was sterilized. Of course, we, we used to sterilize, well, how could you sterilize yourself? We used to wash our hands good, you know, and we had this, uh, this uh, uh, ginger vial, whatever it was, this blue stuff, you know, we put on your hands, you know. Of course, we didn't wear surgical gloves. You know, at that time, there was no uh, AIDS. Or <laughs> If there was AIDS, I would have been dead, but I had so much blood on me, you know. But anyway, so I used to make up this uh, plasma, you know, and get it ready, you know, and uh, the doctors would uh, 
put it into the vein, you know. And that would help the soldiers a lot, you know. We gave a lot of that uh, plasma, you know. We, get, we saved a lot of soldiers that way. And uh, we, you know, we kept coming up, going up, you know, went through the, through the Pole Valley. And uh, when uh, we went uh, through, um, through, um, up through, um, uh, Milan, Turin, uh, up to Lake Homer. By that time, the, the Germans were en route. See, they were en route. But we, 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 in fact, we have formed what they call a spearhead. So we kept moving, but we had, to, we had to support these troops that were moving, you know, so we had to go with them. Because we, we, we weren't able to set up uh, any hospital tent, so but we, we just, acted as aides, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of aid, and in fact, a lot, we had to carry the wounded with us because we couldn't go back, because the Germans were behind us. And uh, so we kept moving up, so, uh, until we got to uh, a place, I remember, oh yes, then we went into, uh, going up this, we went to a place called uh, Bologna, or more than a place like that, and there was a big, big hospital there. And uh, there was a lot of German wounded in that hospital, so we left. Some of the doctors stayed, I don't know, one or two doctors stayed, and we put a lot of our wounded. We left them in this hospital, you know, and one of the doctors or whatever stayed uh, to take care of these wounded, and we kept moving up, you know, we kept going. And we went through Milan, we went up to, um, uh, Lake Como, all, almost up to uh, Austria, because now the Germans, we got them all trapped into Italy, you know, and they were trying to get out. So then we came around the other side, and uh, at that time the Germans surrendered in Italy. So the war had ended in Italy. So we were very happy, you know, and uh, then uh, from there, uh, I don't know. I, I I don't remember if I went into Germany or not through through Austria. So well, anyway, uh, then they took they sent us back to Italy because at that time then they went by the point system. If you had so many points, you know, and I had quite a few points, so I was one of the lucky ones that they took send us back. You know, the war had ended in Italy. And Germany was in the, uh, almost uh, ready to surrender, so like so. So we went back into Italy, and they took us to a place called La Lazio. It was a real resort area, beautiful place, and uh, we set up there. Of course, the war in Japan wasn't over yet. Well, anyway, that came after. So we set us up in there, and then what they did there is they brought a lot of these soldiers that were ready to go home, but they were kind of a, uh, something uh, that wasn't right with them. Maybe they were nervous, so they were uh, shell shocked. But they didn't call them shell shocked at that time. Where were one they call them shell shocked? We used to say NYD. NYD meant not yet diagnosed. You know, they weren't. <laughs> We didn't push that job. Because the guys would see shell shock, they would get more. <laughs> they would get sick, but more, whatever. So they send a lot of, they set these hotels up, and they hired a lot of the, <coughs> the people that ran these hotels, like waiters and stuff like that. And uh, the, the American rations, they would give them the American rations, the hotels, and they would cook it, you know, and uh, they try to make these boys a little, you know, they, were, they had these psychiatrists, you know, that, that would examine, you know, before they would send them home. So I spent a month there, a month there, being you know, we were in medic, you know, I was in charge of the hotel, you know, anybody who got sick, <laughs> nobody would get sick anymore. <laughs> that was good. Of course, we had a lot of guys that were pulling around with guns and stuff and I would shoot each other, oh boy. So. <laughs> I stayed there about a month, and then we went to another place called, being I was in the medics, you know, they kept us, uh, replacement center, because the war was on with Japan yet. So a lot of troops came from America, 
and they never got into battle yet, so now they're going to ship these fellas to Japan. So a lot of them didn't get their shots yet. So they kept us there to get them shots. So we get them the shots, you know, tetanus shots, uh, all these different shots that the army would give, you know. And uh, these they would put them on the ship to send them to Japan. So I spent uh, another month there. Well, anyway, I stayed in Italy after the war about three months. So after that, they said they promised us that if uh, you know, we would stay, they would ship us home by air, airplane, you know, and they wouldn't have to, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't have to go by ship, you know, to try and make us happy, you know. So he says, okay. So that's, we did that, you know. And uh, finally the word came that we were, they were going to send us home. So they sent us home. So from there, we went to a, a town called Pisa. The Leaning Tower, Pisa. And there was an airport there. They put us on a B B-17, you know, bombers, you know, they just have put a little seat there, you know, did all our bags and we flew from there. We flew to um, to Africa. Uh, Dakar, Africa, because they had a system, you know, the planes couldn't go over the ocean yet, you know, it wasn't they took us to Dakar, Africa. Now we stayed there a day, and then, and then they had a bigger plane there. It was called a C, C-47, something like that. Anyway, they, they held, they could take 40, 40 people. We didn't have planes that carried 300 yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 40 people. So they loaded us on that with our barracks bags and all that. From there, they drew, flew us across to Brazil. Natal, Brazil. Now, when we got there, a well, hurricane was happening. <laughs> so now we're stuck in Brazil for three days. There's a big hurricane going on, so we couldn't fly back. So from Brazil, we stayed there three days. Then they, they put us on the plane again. It's funny. Uh, they took us to, uh, to uh, from Brazil, where the hell do we go? Oh, a British Guiana. See, they had stations. Mm -hmm. When we get off the plane, of course, you know, uh, they would feed us, you know, they would have like a, a mess hall, you know, we go in there, we have a mess, who feed us, you know, and stuff like that. If you had to go to the men's room, bedroom, whatever, you know, because on the planes they didn't have anything like that in those days. So, okay, so now we're in uh, British Guiana, from British Guiana. Of course, as we leave, other troops were coming in, so, you know, that's the way they worked it. They're like stepping stone. So from there, they took us to uh, Puerto Rico. Imagine that. They took us to Puerto Rico. <laughs> so we stayed there one day, you know, gave us all clean clothes and stuff like that, you know, and, uh, <coughs> you know, trying to get you ready. So from there, then, Puerto Rico, we went, we flew into, um, uh, in Florida, Fort Myers, I think it was, uh, air base, you know, it was all Army air bases. Okay, so we're in Fort Myers now, and uh, we stood there a day or so, you know, and then he put us on a train, a train, and the train rode all night, and we wind up. Next day, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Oh, we're getting here at home, you know. <laughs> I go to Fort Dix, New Jersey, you know, meantime, I called up, when I got in Florida, you know, I called up home, and I'm telling them I'm on my way home and all that, and they were all happy, you know. So, my brother was in the service. Uh, he was a, he was an MP in Fort Dix, so they told me, look, be a brother, you know. So when I got to Fort Dix, New Jersey, you know, I, I, I looked, I found my brother, and he says, you know, Papa's here, he came there, he's in the, uh, 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 they had a center where, a visiting, a visiting center, you know? Oh, where, you know, so next day, of course, 
in the meantime, you know, they, they uh, 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 I don't know what they call it, getting you out of the army, you know, because <laughs> they got doctors examine you, you know, and get all different things, you know, stuff like that. So you had to go through that. Okay, so that day I was all uh, finished with that, you know, and uh, I got my uniform on and all, you know, and I'm looking for the visiting center, you know. So I ask around, you know, oh, yeah, you got to go down, yeah, okay. So I go to the visiting center, and what, I see my father sitting there. He's sitting on a bench, you know. So I'm walking towards him, you know, and uh, I'm, and he's not moving. And I cheer. So I finally said to him in Italian, <laughs> don't, don't you recognize me? <laughs> and that's all I had to say to him. Well, you know, what happens then. So anyway, he was glad to see me and all, you know, so happy. And uh, I says to him, well, I got to stay here another day. I won't be able to be uh, uh, discharged until tomorrow. So, so anyway, I finally got my discharge papers. I met my father, my brother. He got permission from his officer to come home, and we came home. And uh, that's it. I came home back to Brooklyn, got out of the fan, out of the subway, see my whole family. Everybody was happy to see me. And that's my story as far as the army. After that, of course, I became a civilian. <laughs> when did you marry your sweetheart? When did you get married? Well, uh, yes. Oh, while I was in the service, um, she was very loyal to me. She used to write to me almost every day, you know. I used to get letters from her. And uh, her name was uh, 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 Vivian. In Italian it's called Vincenza, but we called her Vivian for short. She was very faithful to me. And uh, when I come home, I, uh, after three months, I came home on August, oh yes, that was the date, August 11th. 1945, I came home, and I married October 21st, 1945, <laughs> three months later, you know, so, uh, and we had a nice life. Now we're married 55 years. I have uh, three daughters. I have uh, six grandchildren, and I have two great-grandchildren. And I had a, 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 nice, uh, a nice life. I, I was very happy to be alive, of course. <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed my life, you know. I uh, was very happy with my family. I, uh, they all respect me. I respect everybody else, you know. And I always think about the Army. How do you think that changed your life or affected your life, your military service? Well, uh, it affected quite a lot. It, it it helps me to remember, and helps me to uh, ha have more respect for people, you know. And uh, I try to help a lot of people because now you know it, it's in my system. Because I see a lot. So I don't know, you know, what else I could tell you. I'm, uh, I'm now uh, 82. You look great. My uh, birthday is going to be uh, next month, October 19th. I'll be 83, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty good health, you know. Uh, and uh, you know, I, uh, my wife and I, uh, we, we've been going on a lot of trips in our, in our life. We own our own home. I have a, a nice car, <laughs> and that's all. That's all I needed, just to be in a nice, safe place. Did you ever uh, go to any of the USO shows? I never was fortunate enough 
to be able to because I uh, <coughs> didn't stay in America too long. After I was inducted into the Army, in three months I found myself overseas already, you know, and they had said, uh, oh, we won't send our men overseas and <laughs> unless they won one year, but, well, you know, I didn't get into action until uh, a year later, I think, in November, December of uh, 40, uh, 42. You know, in North Africa, that was, uh, but uh, North Africa wasn't too bad. You know, the worst part of my life for the battle was on the Anzio Beach. That was the waste four months. A lot of men died in that place there. A lot of men. I visited the cemetery, and I also went back to Italy for the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Rome. Uh, President Carter was there, and um, Senator Dole, I, I have a picture with him, you know. <laughs> of course, he uh, he also fought in Italy. Of course, he, he was in him, and he was mortally, not mortally, he was uh, seriously wounded, uh, Senator Dole, uh, in Italy, you know, he was a lieutenant, mm -hmm. yeah. But he was seriously wounded there, you know, but uh, he looks all right. <laughs> Have you stayed in contact with anyone that you were, uh, that you served with? Yes. I, I uh, belong, well, <clears throat> I belong to the VFW, and I also belong to the uh, Anzio Beachhead Veterans of World War II. And every year we have a reunion. Now, uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, the last time I had the reunion with Colorado Springs, Colorado, was very nice. Uh, there were four uh, people that I was really that were in the First Armored Division Company C with me. Uh, one came from Brooklyn, and. Uh, Two came from Manhattan, and two from New Jersey. But those are the people that I stayed more in contact with while I was in the service, because you know we had something in common. Most of the other soldiers that were in the uh, First Armored Division, and the First Armored Division was formed in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And there were a lot of young boys there, 18 year old, they wanted to drive vehicles, they wanted to drive jeeps, they want, you know, just before the war, <laughs> that they had formed this division, you know, the first armored division, because we never had an armored division. It's some, similar to the Germans, they call them Panzers, Panzer division. It's a tank tank division, you know. Had, you know, they had the, the, the tank division, they had artillery, they had the 6th Infantry, uh, heck war, and we had the medical. We were the medical. We supported the division, you know. We were part of the division. And that's how I saw all these young boys, but most of them were from Kentucky. But they were okay. We we, we had no problem with, uh, of course, we called them hillbillies, and <laughs> they called us other names, you know. But that was part of the whole thing, you know. And uh, we, people from different parts of the country, which kind of helped the Army a lot because we had different experiences. Some were farmers, so they knew about farming. Uh, 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 from New York, we knew about, you know, how to operate in the, in the cities and stuff like that, you know, and uh, different people, you know. So we, we got along good, you know, uh, guys, uh, of course, we had to dig a lot of holes. <laughs> So the guy said, I'll show you how to take that hole, give me that shovel, you know, yeah, take the shovel. <laughs> Things like that, you know. So we, we, we you know, it was, uh, it was fun, of course. Uh, we went to town a lot, you know, met different, uh, those stories I don't want to tell too much. <laughs> it was nice, the people were good to us, you know. Uh, people that we met, you know, civilians in different places. A lot of them would take me to their homes, you know, and uh, 
meet the family and have a they make a dinner, you know, and being I could speak Italian, you know, and always I, uh, whenever we um, we went to a small town or place like that, I look for a place to stay, you know, I don't want to sleep on the ground, so I run, you know, and I, I see a house, you know, or something like that, I knock on the door, you know, and they'd be afraid, oh, I says, no, 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 I speak Italian, you know, oh, they were afraid of the colored uh, or the black. That time they called them they black, but they were good soldiers. They were good too, but uh, you know they were afraid of them. They they, they didn't understand, you know, the uh, black soldiers. You know, I said, no, they were all right. They were good. They didn't uh, do any. Uh, of course, they used them mostly uh, for transport. They drove trucks, you know, supplies. They used them. Uh, on the docks, you know, to, to, to unload ships and stuff like that, supplies. Well, they had, they had one, um, I think we were, was with us. There was one infantry division, a black infantry division, that came with us, you know, and uh, they didn't come with us, but they were part of that, part of the front that we were on, you know. But we, was, we were backing them up, you know. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the first armor was, in that area, you know, in case the Germans try to break through, but they were up in the front, you know, trying to hold the line up at that area, you know, and certain places that we were, you know, so they used the black troops, and they, the people told them, oh, we saw these people oh, crawling on the ground, you know, we didn't know what they were. <laughs> no, they were, the, they were the infantry, you know, so they were up in the front. So I, I used to knock on the door and they give us a room. I remember one time, you know, I was all full of mud, you know, my shoes, all the clothes, all dirty, you know. So uh, we went, you know, this town was called, um, it was near Florence, it was called Firenze Fiorentino. I say it in Italian. <laughs> it was a small town that we uh, the whole division had. Uh, they put us in a rest area, you know, we came back, because you couldn't put everybody up in the front line. Italy was a small, a small country, so you couldn't put everybody, you know, so same, unless certain outfits, would, they would pull back, and you put you in reserve. So you would stay back in a, in a reserve area, and there you would, um, you would clean up. Now, this, they, they took us good care of us. They had these big trucks that would come. They had showers. It's like a a big van truck, you know. And 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 they had all the equipment. They had the the the, uh, the pumps to pump the water, you know. They would go near a river or something. They would pump the water and they would filter the water. They would heat up the water. And and they had these showers, you know. You go in one side. And what they did was. You go in one side, you took all your clothes off. You took your valuables. They gave you a bag. You put all your valuables in this bag, and you tied it, you put your name on. You put it there. You took all your clothes off, except your, your shoes, you would tie them because, you know. And you went in. You took a shower. They gave you a soap. You wash yourself. You come out on the other side. The guys will give you clothes, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, w it wasn't your uniform, you know, your, your what the hell they call those, uh, anyway. And uh, what size pants, what size shirt, you know, they got to give you all clean clothes, and, and they would bring your valuables and your shoes on the other side. <laughs> and you put your shoes on, you know. So, well, at this time, I, we, went, we went to this house, this is Florence Fiorentino, and um, it was me and my friend, Mike, Mike Coletti. He, he was a secretary. He used to, uh, his job was, he was Sergeant Mike Coletti. He would take a, a wounded come in, would take his name. Of course, we, if he wasn't able to speak, we'd get his dog tags. Dog, uh, that's why we had dog tags. He had two of those dog tags. Gave your name your address and uh, your your religion with C for Catholic people. And, you know, you, you would write that down. So you would take a list. So this list would, type of wound and all that, would go to headquarters. So this is where headquarters would know 
how many men were wounded, hospitalized, or how many were killed, so they wouldn't know how to get replacements or warn the family of the person dead in action, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I went in, you know, getting back to this house, you know. It was me and my friend Mike. So we had all dirty clothes. <laughs> so the lady gave us a nice room, you know. Wow, what a bed. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so we took, you know, we got clean clothes. We went down. They told us uh, they go, <clears throat> there's going to be a chow line, you know. Uh, so we went to chow. And then they said, oh, they're going to have a movie. They got a movie theater. They put a camera in there, you know. It's a little town. So we went to the movie. Well, I come back. The ladies, they took all our clothes. They cleaned them all up. They cleaned all our clothes. I said, Jesus, look at that. The shoes, they cleaned them all. Now the boots, you know, were all full of mud. You know? And they cleaned, you know, oh, Jesus. And that was, uh, and what we used to do is, um, you see, <clears throat> They used to have leftovers at the child, you know, after the child was done. A lot of people used to <clears throat> used to line up that little pots or pans to get the food. Mm -hmm. See, whatever was left over after the GIs would finish eating, if there was any food left over, they would come and they would give it to the c civilians. They ain't gonna throw it in a sump hole. Mm -hmm. Well, what I used to do is, uh, me and my friend, we used to wait until everyone had finished eating, no one wanted any more food, if there was anything left over. But we would put it in our mess kit, I would take it to the, to the, to the lady, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she was very happy about that, you know. And, uh, you know, we stayed there. Uh, couple of weeks. They didn't keep us too long on <laughs> the rest period. Couple of weeks, then we went back up Mount, <clears throat> Mount, uh, well anyway, we went up that way through the Pole Valley, you know, and the thing that I told you before, and uh, that was it. That was one incident that uh, be my, my language, you know, my being, like I speak Italian, it would help me, it helped me a lot, you know. And uh, that was good, you know. And uh, that's my experience. No. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Okay, that was very good. Thank you very much, sir. Great interview. Yeah.